The moment has arrived to reflect very seriously on what is called inner consideration. When one identifies with oneself, one loves oneself very much, feels pity for oneself, self-considers, thinks that one has always behaved very well with everybody, with the wife, the children, etc., and feels that nobody has appreciated it. In short, one is a saint and all the others are evil, are rogues. It is written that in the Gnostic, esoteric work, spiritual growth is only possible through the forgiveness of others. If someone lives from instant to instant, from moment to moment, suffering for what he is owed, for what others have done to him, for the bitterness others have caused him always with the same song, nothing will be able to grow within him. The Lord's Prayer says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. If we are owed, we owe. If we demand that we be paid to the last denarius, we have first to pay the last farthing. The law of mercy is a more elevated influence than the law of the violent man. The eye for the eye, tooth for the tooth. It is urgent, pressing, unpostponable to please ourselves intelligently under the marvelous influences of the Gnostic esoteric work, to forget that people owe us, to eliminate from our psyche any kind of self-consideration. We must never allow within ourselves feelings of revenge, resentment, negative emotions or anxieties due to wrongs inflicted on us, violence, envy, or the incessant remembrance of debts, etc. Gnosis is intended for those sincere aspirants who really want to work and to change. If we observe people, we can see directly that each person has his own song. To pass to a superior level of the being, it is necessary to cease being what one is. We need not be that which we are. If we continue being what we are, we will never be able to pass to a superior level of the being. If we want to transform ourselves radically, we need to sacrifice our own sufferings. The life of each one of us with all of its seasons is always the same, repeating itself from existence to existence throughout the innumerable centuries. The repetition of dramas, comedies, and tragedies is a fundamental axiom of the law of recurrence. The actors in each of these recurring scenes are those people who live within us, the eyes. If we disintegrate those actors, those eyes which originate the ever-repeated scenes of our life, then the repetition of such circumstances becomes more than impossible. Thus we can liberate ourselves from the laws of return and recurrence. Thus we can truly free ourselves. Each of the characters' eyes that we carry within repeats the same role from existence to existence. If we disintegrate it, if the actor dies, the role concludes. Reflecting seriously on the law of recurrence, or the repetition of scenes in each return, we discover by means of inner self-observation the hidden influences in this matter. If in the previous existence, at the age of 25, we had a love affair, the I from that liaison will indubitably seek the lady of its dreams at the age of 25 in the new existence. It is easy to comprehend that the two eyes, both his and hers, seek each other telepathically and meet once again to repeat the same amorous adventure as in the past existence. Two enemies who fought to the death in the past existence will look for each other again in their new existence to repeat their tragedy at the appropriate age. 
if two people took legal action over real estate. The age of 40 in the past existence, the same age they will search for each other telepathically. In the new existence, to repeat the same. Inside each of us live many people, with many commitments. This is irrefutable. A thief carries within a den of thieves, with different criminal commitments. The murderer carries within a gang of murderers and lecherous in their psyche a brothel. With good reason it has been said that everything happens to us, just as when it rains or thunders. Really we have the illusion of doing, but we do nothing. Things happen to us, and this is inevitable, mechanical. Our personality is really the instrument for different people eyes through which each one of those people eyes fulfills its commitments. To emerge from this misfortune, from this unconsciousness, from such a lamentable state as we find ourselves in is only possible by dying in ourselves. He who truly awakens acquires, as a result, complete objectivity of consciousness authentic enlightenment, happiness. We can say that 97% of the essence that we carry within us finds itself trapped, bottled up, stuck within each of the eyes which together constitute the myself. Any eye that is disintegrated liberates a certain percentage of consciousness. The greater the quantity of disintegrated eyes, the greater the degree of self-consciousness. The awakening of consciousness is only possible by dissolving the I, dying in oneself, here and now. Unquestionably, while the essence or consciousness is imprisoned within each of the eyes that we carry within, it is asleep in a subconscious state. It is urgent that we transform the subconscious into consciousness, and this is only possible by annihilating the eyes, by dying in oneself. Newborn children are wonderful. They enjoy total self-consciousness. They are totally awake. Within the body of the newborn child, the essence is reincorporated, and this gives the baby its beauty. As the new personality is forming, the eyes which come from previous existences are entering the new body little by little. That which continues beyond the grave is the ego, the pluralized I, the myself, a mass of devils within which the essence or consciousness is found trapped, which will in its appointed time return and reincorporate. The I which believes itself to be the base on which we rely must be dissolved, if in reality we wish for authentic bliss. This I underestimates people, feels it is better than everyone else, more perfect in everything, wealthier, more intelligent, more experienced in life, and so on. To begin to realize the real state of nothingness and misery in which we find ourselves is absolutely impossible as long as the concept of more exists within me. For example, I am more just than another, wiser than so-and-so, more virtuous, and so on. When one discovers that which most offends in a particular moment, the discomfort that something or other causes, then one discovers the bases on which one depends, psychologically. It is necessary to note carefully when and how much one disdains others feeling superior, perhaps due to a title or social position, acquired experience or money, etc. It is very grave to feel oneself rich, superior to someone for some reason or another. Such people cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. When one begins to comprehend one's own misery and nothingness, when one abandons delusions of grandeur, when one discovers the folly of so many titles, honors and vain feelings of superiority over one's fellow man. It is an unmistakable sign that one is beginning to change. 
One cannot change if one clings to that which says my house, my money, my property, my job, my virtues, my intellectual capacities, my artistic abilities, my knowledge, my prestige, and so on. This clinging to mine, to my, is more than enough to impede our recognition of our nothingness and inner misery. To perceive ourselves through external things, to base ourselves in them, is equivalent to being in a state of absolute unconsciousness. The most serious aspect of this tragedy is that we think we are thinking, and that we feel that we are feeling, when in reality it is another who in a given moment thinks with our tortured brain, and feels with our afflicted heart.